I'm Rob Skinner, and this is the Rob Skinner Podcast. Listen today as I read from chapter two of my, of my book, How to Plant and Grow a Church, a complete manual for small church growth. I'll talk about the power of church planting and why it's more important than ever. All this and more on the Rob Skinner Podcast. Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no regrets life, make this life count, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. I hope you're planning on going to the CLIMB Small Church Leadership Conference in Dallas, Texas, November 30th through December 3rd, 2023. It's going to be an amazing time to learn, to grow, to build relationships with other like-minded people, kingdom-minded disciples from around the world who want to grow, who want to learn, and who want to be their best for God. So I hope to see you in Dallas. Also, if you have a desire to lead, to plant, or lead a church, or you'd like to become an evangelist or women's ministry leader, I have something you should consider. I'm looking to hire for the following positions. If you want to become a church leader in the future, but you need more experience in the basics of ministry, and you want someone to walk with you, to show you how to do it, I'm looking for male and female interns who will start on campus and graduate to church planting or leadership in the future. It's part of our what we call our ministry incubator program. Secondly, if you're ready to lead a campus ministry right now, I'm looking for a couple to lead the University of Arizona campus ministry. We'd like you to join us immediately starting in January of, of 2023, and then in the fall, you will assume the leadership of the campus ministry. And finally, if you already have ministry or church leadership experience and you're just waiting for your shot to lead your own church, we're looking for an experienced couple of any age to lead a church planting in the Tucson metropolitan area. All of these are paid positions, so please let me know if you or someone you know are interested in this opportunity. Email me at rob at robskinner.com, rob at robskinner.com. Chapter 2. The Power of Church Planting You may be thinking to yourself, wow, church planting is difficult. The challenges will be many. I know my imperfections. Am I enough for this task? If you're a young leader, you may wonder how much time and experience you need to launch into the mission field. If you're retired, you may wonder whether it's too late. Here's the good news. Planting a small church can open the door for many types of people to serve in leadership capacities. There is a unique power in planting small churches and a biblical model for doing so. Small churches can be flexible and responsive in a way that larger churches struggle to find. Why is this? And what open doors might lie before you? As churches get larger and larger, the rate of growth tends to drop dramatically over time, slowly, imperceptibly, Members in a large church may feel that the church is large enough, that their needs are met. As the church becomes more and more comfortable, some will drift towards becoming the third soil that Jesus mentions in Mark chapter 4, choked by the desires of this life and cares of this world. As the church's membership and programs grow, the original mission can get lost. The following allegory points to this. Many years ago, there was a little village on a rocky seacoast where storms often battered and seas were ever treacherous. Many ships were driven onto the rocks by the storms, and the lives of many sailors were lost because of the raging seas. One day, the people decided among themselves that they should establish a lighthouse and life-saving station on a little peninsula on the coast to warn ships away from the rocks and to save the lives of those cast into the icy waters. They approached the government and began to secure the necessary funds for their project. Soon, they set forth and built a tower and set a beacon in it. They organized a lookout system, and they bought boats and learned how to man them. And soon they're in business, the business of saving lives. Soon the effects of what they were doing became known far and wide. Fewer ships went on the rocks, 
And when such a tragedy did occur and the alarm was sounded, the people risked their own lives to rescue those who had been cast into the raging icy waters. Within a few short years, people came from a great distance to study their lighthouse and to use it as a model. One day, someone suggested that since they all spent so much time at the lighthouse, that they should gather there occasionally and enjoy good fellowship. And soon they, soon they began to get together, at first infrequently and then more often, at the lighthouse. In fact, many people began to build their homes near the lighthouse. Then, when the lookout sounded the alarm, they were there, ready to go out. Next, it was decided that if they were going to spend so much time there, they must make the place more comfortable. So, arrangements were made to heat the lighthouse. The gray walls were painted a brilliant white. Some of the walls were paneled. Rugs were put on the floors to disguise the bare concrete. A fine kitchen was installed with a handsome stove, and generally speaking, the lighthouse became a nice place to spend your time waiting for the alarm to be sounded. Everything about the lighthouse was made comfortable and nice. The lighthouse soon became the center of life in the little town that grew up around it. One night, a fierce storm blew in, as storms had blown in for years. Many ships were tossed on the jagged rocks, and the men at the lighthouse spent long hours picking sailors from the bitter, cold, icy waters and taking them to the lighthouse, where they were fed and provided with dry clothing. This had happened many times over the years, but this time, after the storm subsided and the sailors had all left the lighthouse, there were some men who were angry. It seems a storm had made them leave the comfort of the lighthouse and go out into the wet, dangerous seas, and they got cold, very cold. The sailors, when they were delivered to the lighthouse, soiled the carpets. The kitchen was a mess, not to mention the stove. After a brief meeting sometime later, another storm blew in, and about one half of the men went out into the boats and again picked sailors from the frigid waters. This time the ship, which had broken apart on the rocks, was from another nation and the men who manned her spoke another language, and even worse, were of a different color. After this storm, a few more men joined those who refused to enter the sea. They decided that men like these did not belong in the lighthouse at all. Some said they felt that the lighthouse's job was not supposed to be saving sailors from other lands, because they were so much different. There were those, too, who objected to leaving the comfort of the lighthouse to go out into the storm. These men petitioned the government, and they also agreed. So finally, it was decided that the beacon would be kept lit, but the rescue work would be discontinued. A small group disagreed, however, and went down the coast a short distance and started a new lighthouse. This small group decided that they should establish the biggest life-saving station on the little peninsula, and so they did. Every day, they warned ships and sometimes attempted to save lives from the icy water. The fame of the new lighthouse grew, and the lighthouse back up the bay eventually turned out its beacon. Some people say the beacon can still be seen today in you and I. Oh yes. They also say the small group running the new lighthouse were those once rescued from the raging seas. The power of the small church is its ability to focus on the mission Jesus gave all Christians to seek and to save the lost. As the church grows larger, The resources necessary to support that church grow significantly. Money is needed to pay staff that becomes increasingly expensive to support. As a church matures, the staff ages with it, and staff salaries and benefits increase accordingly. Young, small churches, on the other hand, can be led by less experienced, less expensive leaders. Few leaders have the full toolkit of skills necessary to shepherd a megachurch of over a thousand disciples. The ability to communicate, organize, administrate, and deal with the myriad challenges of a large organization is rare. However, a significant number of people can lead a smaller church and make it grow and flourish. Planting 10 churches that grow to 150 each would lead to a combined membership of over 1,500. However, getting a church from 500 to 1,500 is often nearly impossible to achieve for even the most gifted church leader. Many churches are now around 500 to 600 disciples and have hit a plateau for some years. They're not multiplying, but rather adding at a rate that leaves many young women and men uninspired and causes them to look elsewhere to devote their energy and time. A viable solution for the continued growth 
is to open the door for more young men and women to plant new churches. Many of our metropolitan areas are clusters of connected cities where one church does its best to reach a vast geographic area. Wouldn't it be better to have many smaller churches reaching the various cities and towns of a metropolis? As it is now, there's a bottleneck as we look for new areas to reach for the gospel. For every minister who has the gift gift set to lead a church of a thousand members, there are probably a hundred ministers who can lead a church of 150. Does the notion of starting a church excite you? Here are some questions to meditate on and think about. First, do I have the passion for planting a church? Do I have the talent and ability to plant a church? And am I in a life situation that would enable me to consider it? Thanks for listening. If you're enjoying this podcast, I'd like to ask your help. First, hit the subscribe button. Secondly, post the episode on on your favorite social media program and let your friends know about it. Thirdly, take some time and read and review one of my books. My first book I wrote is the one I'm reading right now, How to Plant and Grow a Church. And my second book is Courage, How to Make This Life Count. And you can find both of these on Amazon.com. Finally, email me if you have any life advice you'd like me to address, or if you have a topic or person you'd like to hear on the program. Because my goal is to inspire you to make this life count, to live a no regrets life, and to multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Have a great day and make this life count.